is my first time seeing it for real. The house is in Setagaya, Tokyo, where the Miyazawa family were murdered. It's an unusual sight, something out of a fairy tale. It stands alone in the middle of a park. I was expecting it to be covered in a blue tarp, but it's just surrounded by some orange fencing. 22 years ago, it was a similar story. The houses in the area were gradually being sold off and demolished in preparation for a new development. A development which has never materialised. So it's just standing empty. Since then, a Tokyo Metropolitan Police officer has stood guard outside. Every single day, there is an officer who makes sure the house is preserved just the way it always was. The house itself is surrounded by weeds. The roof is in need of some maintenance. All the curtains are closed except for one window. Every year on the anniversary of the murders, detectives gather outside to pay their respects. I've read so much about, about the, the scene. I've heard about it from Nick, who's been here so many times, but seeing it for real, it really, but this is, this is a, a real, true life tragedy that happened. Today, the house is a shrine to the Miyazawa family and a permanent reminder to passers-by of the horrors that took place inside. I can hear some kids talking about this being the, the scene of a murder in the background. So the locals know, know what this house is. They know what happened here. But it's what happened inside the house in the hours after the crime that I want to focus on in this episode. Because one of the most striking details about this case is the faceless man didn't hurriedly flee the scene. He stayed in the house for hours, maybe even all night. It's like a nightmare version of Goldilocks. And I think there's a lot we can learn from the things that he did. From What's the Story Sounds and USG Audio, I'm Nick Obregón. This is Faceless. Episode 3. When Tokyo Metropolitan Police officers arrived at the Miyazawa family home, they encountered a chaotic scene. Four dead bodies, blood, footprints, fingerprints, and signs of a struggle. They knew that trying to work out the sequence of events, the who, the where, and the when, would be crucial to solving the crime. And so, CSI officers assessed every corner of the house to work out exactly where the killer had been. They didn't know what was out of place and what wasn't, what belonged at the scene and what didn't. And there was no time to waste in finding out. Their first focus was to ascertain how the killer had got in and got out. The accepted theory is that the killer entered the property sometime after 10pm. That's a time when Mikio Miyazawa, the father, opened a document that was password protected on his computer. It would have been dark outside. The streets around here would have been quiet. 10, 11 p.m. at night, in the middle of winter, December 30th. People are going to be at home, they're going to be staying warm. They're going to be watching TV. They're not going to be out in the park. So it's a... Maybe it would have been easy to slip in and then slip out again without anyone noticing. The two children were inside the home. Ray and Nina were more than likely already asleep. In episode one, I told you that the killer broke in through a second floor window into the bathroom. 
The window is at the back of the house, facing outwards towards a children's playground and the adjacent skate park. When police searched the area, they found a grill which protected the window and it was detached. And they saw that an intruder could gain access to the window by climbing a small tree, scaling the perimeter fence and then balancing on a fuse box which is fixed to the back of the property. I asked Ryushi to go and look at the house and he doubted whether it was even possible to get in through the bathroom window. I mean, they say he climbed, they say if he went in through the window, he'd have climbed this, this tree here, but this isn't, this tree's not big enough. But he could have scrambled up to, I guess, if he'd stood on the windowsill and pulled himself up, but he'd need to be an athlete. There's a power box, and the window itself is maybe, maybe like two feet by one and a half feet. I'd always assumed that it was proven the killer had entered this way. But Chief Suchita cast some doubt on that theory. We know the second floor bathroom window was open and the net window was on the ground below it. So we can deduce the killer entered and left through the window. However, it's not possible to enter through a narrow window like that without leaving some kind of trace. And forensic officers found no fibers on the frame, and there were no footprints or blood on the rim of the bath. So, not clear cut. The other possibility is that the killer simply entered and left through the front door. But that doesn't add up either. There's absolutely no evidential proof of how he entered. Did Mikio open the door? Did the killer have a key? Haruko says the door was locked when she arrived. I would expect the killer to have blood on his feet, but no bloody footprints or drops were found at the front door, which suggests he didn't leave that way. If you're confused, I am too. Mikio is believed to have been working downstairs, close to the front door. It doesn't seem likely that Mikio would have willingly let a stranger into his home that late at night. So, did he know the killer and let him in? And we also know that Ray, the youngest, was killed first, because there was no blood at all on his body. So it makes more sense to me that the killer entered the second floor window. But the fact that it's not proven means there's another mystery in the case. I've already told you how the killer moved through the property, committing the four murders with a shocking level of violence. The sushi knife he's brought with him breaks while attacking Mikio. He then goes up the attic ladder to where Nina and Yasuko are asleep. He attacks them, but then at some point stops, goes down the ladder, and collects another knife from the kitchen. In the meantime, maybe assuming the killer had left, Yasuko and Nina go downstairs to grab a first aid kit. But the faceless man then returns to continue the violence. Once the crimes were over, well, the killer does not flee he decides to stay inside the property for at least some hours, maybe even spent the night. The PC was used again at 1am, so only the killer uh, could have used the PC at this time. Uh, and, and then again at 10am, there's records of, of the computer had been used. The exact time the killer was on the computer was 1.18 a.m. and he logs off at 1.23. But the later use at 10 a.m., that's around the time Haruko discovered the scene. Did the killer flee and activate the computer as he went? Or was the computer accidentally turned on by Haruko? From the circumstances, it became more likely that the grandmother next door when she entered the crime scene, 
that she had caught her foot on the computer cable and accidentally pulled it out of the wall. There is at least a theory of what actually happened. Whether he was disturbed or left the scene earlier, we do know the killer spent some hours in the home, and this is what he did. After the murders are over, the killer has to apply first aid to the serious injury on his hand. Police find his glove in the kitchen, soaked in his blood with a large gash in the material. He uses the family's first aid kit to stem the flow of blood. But then he also used something else, Yasuko's sanitary pads. Maybe this sounds unusual, but I've read that it's a technique used by US Marines and no doubt other military too, who found that this absorbent material is perfect to treat deep wounds. After the wound is dressed, the killer then works his way through the house, emptying drawers and scattering documents in a bath half filled with water. The killer emptied the contents of the first floor desk drawers into it, along with the contents of the Yasko's handbag, but it's unclear why. We can suspect he's looking for something, but the bookcases on the first floor were untouched. We don't have any idea what he was searching for. There are cash cards, bank books, and IDs left out next to his belongings on the floor and sofa. Some money was missing from the house, about 150,000 yen, which is about $1,000 today. But other sums of money remained in the house, untouched, despite not being hidden. It makes the theory of a robbery a hard one for me to support. If a robber had broken in with the intention of stealing money, and they stayed for some time in the house, then you'd think they'd have the time to find and take all of the money. So was he looking for something specific? Property deeds, maybe? some other kind of paperwork. If he was, the police have no clue what that was. The killer does other things too. For one, whilst he's there in the house, he needed the toilet. Perhaps not so surprising. But what is surprising is that he chose not to flush the toilet, which officers had the unpleasant task of analysing they found that the killer enjoyed a diet of fresh vegetables and pickled cucumber, what appeared to be a home-cooked meal. One article speculated that it was evidence of mummies cooking. So, was this a killer who lived in a traditional Japanese home with his mum? He helped himself to a number of ice cream cups from the freezer and some barley tea, ignoring the beers, soda and other drinks available. He even ate a melon, scooping out the flesh with his bare hand, rather than using any chopsticks or cutlery. We know that the killer went on the family computer, creating a folder on the desktop, and it seems he may have visited a website for a local theatre, which was listed on Mikio's favourites. The computer and the keyboard were in Japanese, not in English and there were no fingerprints found on the keyboard. Fingerprints were found on the mouse. Could that mean that the killer couldn't read or didn't want to type? As if browsing the internet and raiding the fridge wasn't enough, the faceless man even took time to have a nap on the family couch. A killer dining out on ice cream and tea after slaughtering four human beings browsing the internet, in no rush to leave. It's these decisions which I find so deeply unsettling. I went back to investigative psychologist David Cantor to learn more about this behaviour and to try and make sense of it. Well, it all adds up to somebody who, for a start, is totally relaxed about um, killing and about being with dead bodies lying around and about not being caught. And that fits in with the 
what must have been some sort of planning of the process. So it all adds up to somebody who really um, is used to that whole sort of event. It's somebody um, with a background that for which this would not be unusual. I'm Kathleen Goldhar, and I'm the host of a new podcast, Crime Story. Every week, we bring you a different crime, told by the storyteller who knows it best. You got one witness who can't be found. You got another witness who's murdered. We couldn't sugarcoat the story. I was getting calls from Cosby's attorney threatening to sue every day. Every crime in one way or another is a reflection of who we are as a people, as a city, as a country. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. Something else I've been wondering about these murders is why did nobody hear anything? It's impossible to me that there wouldn't be a noise, a struggle, screams, that there's some sort of fight which causes the killer to injure his own hand. There must have been some noise coming out of that home. Indeed, when officers spoke to Haruko and Anne in the house next door, they said that they did hear noises around 11 p.m. We would normally expect screaming at a scene like this, but there wasn't any reported. Mikio was stabbed in the leg as he was going upstairs, and you'd have expected him to yell to his family to hide or run. Likewise, you would expect Yasuko or Nina to scream, but no one reported hearing any screaming. Remember, next door to the Miyazawa house was another property. And inside that property was Yasuko's mother, Haruko, as well as her sister Anne, and husband, and their teenage son. It's a wood-framed building, so unlike concrete, thuds and bangs travel through the structure. Haruko was asleep on the second floor next door and was awakened by loud thud around 11.20 to 11.30 p.m. These thuds were from the Miyazawa side of the house. She had a TV in her bedroom against the dividing wall and said she heard three thuds from beyond the wall behind her TV. Anne's son, who at the time was in junior high school, he was also asleep on the second floor. That night, he watched TV until 9.30 p.m. before going to bed. He heard a thud and a clunk around 11.30 p.m. from the park. However, our officers found nothing in the park that could have made those noises. So we deduced that these sounds were from next door too. Investigating what could have caused these sounds, we discovered the fold-up staircase to the second floor made the thud and a clunk when lowered and raised. No screams, no noise, other than the thud of a fold-up staircase. The reported times of these noises helps us narrow the time of the crime to around 11.30 p.m. Deducing anything from this behavior in the house, it's not easy. All I'm sure about is that the killer did not panic and run away. But I'm not sure that helps me to figure out who he was. But the question of how the killer gets away, well, that takes us onto a whole new theory. Theory number three. The killer was not working alone. Three men were involved in the murders, and they left the scene together, in a taxi, before disappearing into Tokyo. In the days immediately after the murders, police were appealing for anyone with any information to come forwards. They wanted to speak with witnesses, people in the area who may have seen or heard anything suspicious. And the most striking piece of information came from a Tokyo taxi driver. All right, I've found a news article from the Japan Times from early January 2001. And it reads, Investigators are searching for three men who left bloodstains in a taxi they hailed on Saturday night near a house in Setagaya Ward where a family of four were found murdered on Sunday morning. 
The three men were middle-aged, hailing a cab in the early hours, and they sat in near silence as they travelled to a nearby train station. The taxi driver noticed that one had some sort of injury and later found bloodstains in the back of his car. So who were these men? Could it be coincidence that there was a blood-stained man just a few streets away from the scene of a multiple homicide? And what can we learn about there being three men inside a taxi? We know that only one of the men left any trace of themselves at the scene. The man with the hand injury. But I'm not sure if that proves that only one intruder was in the property. Could it be that the other two men wore gloves, suffered no injuries, and ghosted in and out of the house without leaving any kind of trace? I asked David Cantor about this possibility. Well, I mean, you would think there'd be evidence in the uh, crime scene of more than one person. So I don't know how, I would assume the police had been very thorough about that and they would have picked up um, fibres or they would have picked up some sort of um, fingerprints or other indications that there was more than one person there. What I find remarkable about that is not, uh, say there were two people waiting outside keeping watch, or even that there were two people who were due to come and collect him at some point. What is remarkable is the idea of them getting a taxi rather than having their own vehicle. Perhaps three suspects explains why there were so many ice creams eaten from the family freezer and how the victims were killed and controlled. Three men would surely be able to control the scene much easier than a lone offender. It shows, I mean, if that really is the case, it shows an incredible, you can almost call it nonchalance, an incredible sort of confidence, and shows also that they didn't have very easy access to a vehicle, which would have been a much more obvious way of doing it. My investigation began by looking for the faceless man. Now, it might be three men that I'm looking for. And there's another witness who adds more weight to this theory. The following day, at a train station 100 miles north of Tokyo, called Tobu Niko, a member of train station staff spotted a man in the waiting room with a deep wound in his hand. The injury was so bad that he reported that he could see the bone. Now, was this man, the same man dropped off in the taxi in the early hours of the morning, was he the faceless man? And if so, where were his two friends? I asked Chief Suchita about the sighting and what he made of it. So someone was spotted at at Tobniko station, and so an investigating officer was sent there. But this was several days later. He spoke with the station staff who had spotted this injured person. The staff member said that it was a very deep cut. It was so deep that he couldn't treat it. So we sought the help of the local police department uh, and investigated all the local hospitals to see if anyone had received treatment, but no patients were found. Why wouldn't someone so badly injured go to get help? All of this was ringing alarm bells for me. So I was surprised when the chief went on to dismiss the idea that the train station sighting could be linked to the murders. I personally think it's a, it's a fairly unlikely. It's a very far from, uh, from the crime scene. That's not to say there's a 0% chance of this person being the killer. Uh, but, but I think it's a very loose connection. We can't say for the certain that this person wasn't the killer, but I certainly think it's, uh, it's fairly unlikely. But I wasn't so sure. How many people are walking around with a serious hand injury the day after a murder? I wanted to understand a bit more. So I asked Ryushi if he'd go to Niko and visit the train station. It's a small town, only 76,000 people. Maybe someone would remember. Perhaps the train station employee would still work there. So we've read reports that a witness saw someone very suspicious the day after the murders. Uh, and this was at Tobuniko Station, which is in the mountains a couple of hours north of Tokyo. So I'm heading to Nikko right now to try and find out more. 
there's now the information that no name to the witness. So I'm hoping maybe, just maybe somebody remembers something from December 2000, January 2001. And I've just seen on my phone that it's snowing in Nikko. Luckily, I'm wearing loads of layers. It doesn't look so far on a map, but Nikko can feel like a world away from Tokyo. It's small, quiet and isolated. Ryushi recorded his journey there and he updated me along the way. Obviously, I go and talk to the um, to to the guys at the station. I go to the um, the little manned desk next to the barriers. And I introduce myself and I say, "Hi, I'm uh, working on a podcast. Um, is there can I? Is there anyone I can talk to about what it was like? You know, Setakaya family murders." And then they're like. Very quickly, it became sorry. We 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 can't talk to you. We're not allowed to talk to talk to you. So they've told us to contact the press office uh, and get it all cleared. Ryushi did put in a formal request into their station press office, but they declined to comment. But the trip, it turned out, wasn't a total waste of time. Ryushi spoke to locals who said that their town was so small that any outsider would be noticed. He spoke to one resident who remembered that period well. People treat outsiders with with a degree of suspicion, right? Um, and and she speculated that that if you know if someone uh, were on the run and, and ended up in Nikko, that they would pretty soon be be spotted and, and considered right. suspicious, and it would take them it would take a lot of work to integrate into the local community. Mm. Given the amount the amount of press, given the importance Japanese communities place on, on sort of harmony yeah. uh, and preserving the community, I think at some point someone would have put, you know, joined the dots if, right. if, if the killer was, was someone local. The, the idea of community is, is very strong, mm. um, but, but in, a, in a way that, that means that any anyone who's perceived to be dangerous or an outsider... Mm. Um, someone who's upsetting the harmony will be instantly ostracized everyone is a grass in japan right. this is this is um you you're you'll be in big trouble with the local community if you put put out the wrong kind of trash on the wrong day right, everyone's right. you know everyone's twitching their curtains and i think at some point someone would it would click that that, that quiet boy with with a hard look in his eye mm and a bandage around his hand right. that matches the profile of, of the guy that the police have been searching our town for. Mm. But the man with the injured hand, he hadn't been spotted by anyone else and he hasn't come back through the train station. Staff there would have recognised him and intervened again if he had. So where did he go? Well, Ryushi found a theory nestled high up in the mountains above Nikko. So we know the Nikko is, is a mountainous region and that the, the wilderness is harsh, the climate is harsh. It's very cold in the winter. It's, it's freezing cold. If, if it's not snowing, it's, it's still freezing cold, right? Mm. And it's easy to get lost in those mountains. So either you're hiding out mm. or, or if you kill yourself, mm. either way, you're not going to be found. Mm. Um, and we know you wouldn't be found because people have gone missing right. in the area and they haven't been found for, right. for years. When I arrived at the station, there, there was a poster seeking information about uh, a French woman mm-hmm. who went missing um, four or five years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, she went for a hike and was never found again. Um, the, the lady I was speaking to said, even if the mountains aren't high, it's still easy to, to get lost and it's it can be very hard to find something, right? The, the mountains go for miles and miles. Um, and if, if you get off the path, then you, you wouldn't be found. Mm. I guess, especially if you don't want to be found, Nico or that region, that terrain would make it easy to not be, it would facilitate that for you. And so if you're looking for, if you're looking for someone who doesn't want to be found or if you're looking for a body, it would be very difficult to locate it. Ryushi hadn't found the witness, 
but he had helped me figure something out. If the faceless man had planned to get away to the town of Nico, because either he lived there or he wanted to disappear into the woods, he would have known the quickest way was by train. And the trains wouldn't have been running through the night. So maybe he stayed in the house, not because he had any plans or things he wanted to do there. Maybe he was just killing time, waiting, somewhere he wouldn't be spotted, until the first trains of the day were running. I can't square the idea of three men in a taxi, one of them bleeding, because there's no other evidence they were involved. Maybe that is just a hell of a coincidence. But getting out of Tokyo, away to the north, knowing he wouldn't come back, that I'll accept. It's possible. Next time, I'm going to speak to someone who was questioned by the police about the murders. A most unlikely suspect, but one which opens up an entirely new theory. This podcast was written and hosted by me, Nick Obregón. My producers for What's the Story Sounds are Daryl Brown and Sophie Ellis. In Japan, my producer is Ryushi Lindsay. Sound design by Tom Bruins. Our music is composed by James Warburton and KPM Music. Our USG audio team includes Josh Block and Jennifer Sears. This is a USG audio podcast in collaboration with What's the Story Sounds. If you have any information or leads on this case, please email faceless at whatsthestorysounds.com or reach out to us on Twitter. And if you've enjoyed this series, please leave us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. And check out more USG Audio podcasts at usgaudio.com.